What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Today, I have a very special guest, Scott, a.k.a. Smash the Bid, that a lot of you people probably know him as on Twitter, as I mentioned, Smash the Bid. And Scott, look, you know, for those of you who don't know, he's been trading for six years, day trading at least. And he's also, he's kind of all around very adaptable when it comes to trading. He likes to trade long, he likes to trade short, he likes to trade options, he likes to, trade, he likes to swing. And we're going to get into that today with him. So Scott, thanks for coming on today, my man. Hey, thanks, Alex. Good to be here, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, you know, let's, let's start at the beginning. You know, what, if you can give us a little background, what got you even to here into trading to begin with? All right. So I come from an oil, bill, oil field background. Um, I bought some stocks like in 98, but I could, everything I did was just like, you know what, this, it was oil stocks, things I, you know, I thought I knew, you know, stuff like that. So I got a little bit invested over the years and just kind of hung on some things. There's a few other things that I had. I inherited a few things, but I had a few positions in the stock market, nothing major until about, uh, 2012, well, 28, 2009, 2008, 2009, we had a natural gas boom, right? And we, so we were drilling this area. Um, I live in the four corners, like Southern Colorado area, and uh, they were drilling this area like crazy. So we went through this big boom, and as that was unwinding, uh, I was in, I've been in the oil field since 1986, so this would be my third like big downturn of the oil field. And after this this one here in 2012, when things started winding down, I was like, man, I am not going through another one of these. And uh, you know, I'm still staying pretty busy in the oil field, but I got so from 2012 to about 2014, you know, I started getting more invested. I started buying more and more stocks. And then during that time, I was just, you know, I, I signed up for a bunch of services. I spent like two years before I ever really took like a day trade, so to speak, you know? Dang. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I did get really invested in 2012 to 2014 and some of it, man, like some of them worked out really well. Some of them not so much, but my son was the one that got me. Some of them worked really well, like NVIDIA. No reason I bought NVIDIA. I've got like a 16 and some change average the first time in. And, uh, it was because, you know, he was really into gaming and uh, NVIDIA was coming out with all the game, you know, the gaming GPUs and stuff. So yep. anyway, that's what got me in that. A couple of other ones, AMD, I'm in. Uh, so, so had some pretty good investments. That helped a lot. But I spent a couple of years just, um, I went through, uh, you know, I signed up for a couple of chat rooms, like $10,000 a year kind of thing. But I was in a couple at the same time. So I could really, you know, try to get a good handle on this day trading side of it. And, um, and then in 2000. Uh, March of 2014, I went live and man, I never really looked back, man. I mean, I still, I really, my primary focus is swing trading. I use my day trading and I use options to try to, uh, you know, to take profits on my long-term stuff, to hedge my long-term stuff, take profits on, uh, or, you know, day trading options really to set myself up to pay for my swing trades. Cause I found that if I can tr pay for those swing trades, you know, it's just psychologically for me, it really helps because I, I don't want to sell too soon. They're easy to hang on to, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's what I'm really focused on. Okay. And, and so, so 2016, when you got started into like day trading, so for two years before that, you were just like in chat rooms, kind of learning, kind of getting the, the general idea of how to day trade and then placing no trades, which, well, day trades, at least you were invested right. swing trading, which is, I guess that's why you weren't, that's why you were able to stay patient. Right. And then you start yeah. day trading. Did, was it just hit the ground since you already had experience swinging and was it like swinging for like a month or it sounds like it was swinging for like long periods. Of oh time. yeah. So when I was, when I was starting to buy stocks, you know, get, get build up my portfolio, that was from 2012 to 2014. So that whole time there wasn't a single, I didn't sell anything. All I did was okay. buy. That's it. It was five to 20 year time frame. So okay, I was so looking in, I was doing fundamental analysis, looking to get in what I thought were quality companies, you know? Okay. That makes sense. Cause I, cause now I'm thinking like, so when you jumped into day trading in 2014, did, did what, what happened? Like, was it really easy for you? Was it different, you know, from what you've been doing in terms of challenging? Was it, were, were, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it, it definitely wasn't easy. I, don't, I wouldn't say there's anything easy about any of it. But I did. I started off with, uh, you know, I just put enough cash in there to get past, you know, the PDT rule. So I didn't really have to deal with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just kept, I kept burning the account up back down to thirty thousand, you know, and I put a little bit more in it, and I just kind of worked on that for I don't know about a year of kind of breaking even. I was down 
I don't know, I was down about 17,000. So, you know, I was about $47,000 total that I was down with, with costs and accounts when I kind of started breaking even and I spent, I don't know, um, some sh- you know, short and penny stocks and, you know, some of that stuff in the beginning. I know it's just kind of break even for a good nine months, a year. Um, never really had to reload again. Once I got, I got up over about 50,000 and after that, I kind of started turning things around and I never really had to reload again. I mean, I took some pretty good losses, but you know, I never had to reload after that. So I don't know about a good year, year and a half into it. I was start to see that PNL curve come back up about 18 months in, I kind of broke that 47,000 mark. So, so what was it for you? I mean, do you feel like, cause it sounds at the beginning, you know, we, we talked before we start recording and it said, you mentioned you kind of trade different types of ways where it comes to options, it comes to shorting, longing, you're, you're not biased either way. You'd like to just, so whatever the market gives you, you want to take it. So what kind of helped you in day trading? Were you kind of that way too? Or did you focus on one niche while you were getting better at that? I did. I focused on just short, short and penny stocks at first. I mean, that was my main goal was, uh, I just wanted to short the pennies. I was trading small against them, you know? And like I said, I did that for, I don't know, I did that for a good year and a half. I had some pretty good success. I just, I learned early on. It's like, it's, it's, it wasn't very sustainable for me. I would have a lot of really good trades and build it up and build it up. And then, you know, I'd get, just get those to me like black swan events, so to speak, you know? Um, so I started looking at more, you know, learning options to trade against my long terms. So once I started really getting a handle on options and the value in options and how they, you know, were working for managing risk and so forth on my long term positions, you know, I started seeing the value in those things. And then I just quit uh, doing the penny stocks and just started really focusing on large caps and understanding what moves them and where the big money's in and out and, you know, what and quit because the, the penny stocks to me were, even though I felt like I had a decent edge there, I did okay. It's just, it, they're so easily, you know, manipulated by one group of people, so to speak, rather than the large caps I always felt like, you know, it takes a whole lot more. Um, not one person can just move those large caps, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so let's dive into that. Cause I know, I know options is something you mentioned a couple of times now. So I want to know, I know nothing about options. Okay. Let me just let make that clear. So Give me like the layman terms of what I, you know, I have a buddy of mine who always like, oh yeah, I have calls and, and puts and I have no idea what that means. So if you can give me an idea of what that all means and then I can ask some questions about it. Okay, sure. So the, the, the main goal, I, I'm sure the reason the whole, the whole reason they were created was for managing the long-term stock positions. At least that's how I learned how to use them. I mean, so in, for an options, if you're going to, if you're a buyer of an option, um, you have the right to exercise. So if you want to, if, if you want to buy calls, you know, like let's say a 260 strike calls, if you buy those 260 strike calls, as long as they're in the money, you have a right to buy that stock at 260, right? So if you have one contract, that's hundred shares. And then the seller of the option is obligated to sell you that stock, you know, that hundred shares. Okay. So if you use options, like what I, when I was learning them in the beginning, I was using them against my long-term positions. So there's just a number of strategies you can do, you know, covered calls, covered and put, covered puts, cash covered puts, stuff like that. So you can use them to sell options against your positions. And if you, if you, you get to keep 100% of the premium, if it goes against you, you can just wait and get assigned, you know, and then you're either just selling your stock or you're adding to your position. I do that a lot. I mean, I really just use options to, maintain my long-term positions now rather than like, I don't really buy stocks so much anymore. I just sell options against them. And if I get assigned, I'll sell them. Or if I get assigned, that'll, that'll buy me in, you know, what you mean a sign or assigned, assigned. assigned. Yeah, what is assigned. that? So, um, like I said, the buyer of the option contract has the right to can exercise the right to, let's say to buy the stock at two sixty. Okay. Okay. Whoever sold the option contract, the seller of the option contract, is obligated to sell him those hundred shares. So there's two parties, right? Okay. So if you're gonna sell the options, like I don't just sell options, I like to sell them against my position. Um, does that make sense or did I answer your question? So, so maybe this will help me a little bit better. It, let, let's just do it in 
a fake example, like a hundred, a hundred, is it shares options? Like give me an example of just ticker X, Y, Z. I'm going to blank options. Give me an example real quick. Okay. So here's, here's the the day trading methods is really simplified. So there's so many things you can do with options. We'll just talk about day trading. If you're going to long options, you're going to buy a call and sell a call. Okay. So you could use, you know, 260. This is say Nvidia is trading at 260. Okay. Okay. So there's a 260 strike call. It's at the money. Okay. You could get a 265 strike call. It's out of the money. In other words, the price of the stock is at 260. Yep. The strike price of the option is at 265. It's considered out of the money. Okay. Okay. And so there's a, some time value involved, but just, just for a long story short, basically, yep. if you want to use them as a day trading tool, just there's a value to the option contract. It's a, it's trading for $2. If the price of NVIDIA goes to from 260 to 265, the price of your option can go from, you know, whatever, two bucks to four bucks. Okay. Okay. So, so you buy it at $2. That's, it's a hundred shares. So it's $200. Okay. One contract for $2. That's 200 bucks. If you buy one contract at 200 bucks, the price of the contract goes to $4. You can sell it for 400 bucks. You just turn a profit. You just day trade the options. So okay. You just get long the options. It's, it's like a stock and it's just really leveraged because you know, you're paying a hundred bucks to control or, you know, 200 bucks to control a hundred shares of Nvidia, right? That would cost you, you know, whatever that is. I'm sorry, that dog, man. Two hundred sixty thousand dollars, or whatever, you know, whatever that is. Do the math. Twenty six thousand dollars for hundred shares, right? Okay. So, so like, what about the option? Okay. So I get that. So when it, when if when it goes against you, I always hear people. Maybe, and this is my ignorance. Like they'll say, "Oh, I, you know, I, I'm in it for this long, like a time period." Like, does that mean you can't get out, or like? No, no, no. You can sell it any time as long as there's a bid, right? As long okay. as there's a bid, right? You can sell it. Um, the, the thing about options that I, that I like the most is like, is you can, uh, the way the really good risk management tools. So if you buy one option contract and you spend a hundred dollars on it, mm-hmm. you can't lose more than a hundred bucks period. No matter what, there's no gap risk, none, zero. So for me to buy, you know, calls at, at the dip today, yeah. like I, I, I buy, you know, a thousand dollars worth of calls. Okay. If it doesn't work, I lost a thousand bucks. That's it. I, I can't, even if it gaps down to zero tomorrow, right? I can't lose more than a thousand bucks. So the, the risk is capped. There's no, it's like when you short a penny stock, right? It can just go to the moon, right? If yeah. you don't cut that baby, your, your account's gone, right? Yeah. So, you know, options, long options, when they go to zero or, you know, when it goes against you or whatever, they can go to zero, but they can't go to negative, right? It just goes to zero. So, so, so in other words, like if you buy, you buy calls, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's to so go long. Like if you want to go long a stock, you buy the calls. So if you buy the calls at, you know, let's, let's say a, a dollar and do you get to choose, like if it goes under a dollar, does it automatically take you out or do you get to choose when to get out on that? Oh yeah. Like trading? Just, yeah. yeah it, it has a bid and an offer. It has a, okay. It, it trades just like a stock, man. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, there's market gotcha. makers making a market. I mean, okay. it's just, it's just trades just like a stock. You got a level two or a matrix or Dom or whatever you're used to trading. Right. So the, the, so the main reason why you like options is because the, you can actually, I guess it sounds like you're really controlling the amount that you can lose. So that's a big part of it. Yeah. But one of the things like today, I was long and short at the same time today. Okay. okay. So, so, uh, you know, the 2362 area, the, you know, that's one of my calculated levels where I think the bulls are hanging out, right? Where they're trying to support it. And they did a lot today. So I pick up some calls and then I sell into the pops and just try to reduce my risk, lock in a little bit of gains, lock in a little bit of gains. But then if we break that 2360, I don't want to sell my call positions because I think it can come back, right? I think if we do flush and if we break down hard, you know, of course it probably won't ever come back, right? But until I see that hard breakdown, so I've managed my risk with it. Well, the minute we break 2362 or 236 on the SPY, you know, 236.20, then I can take part in the puts on the same thing. I can be long SPY and short SPY at the same time. So I buy the puts to get short, but I can hold those calls. So I can be long and short at the same time. I could take profits on the puts on the way down. And then if we were to pop and then reclaim 2360, you know, I can, I can be scaling out of both sides and actually manage to be long and short on the stock 
and you know, as long as I'm buying and selling at key levels, does that make sense? And yeah, yeah, it does. Actually, it, I mean, it also sounds like you could lose if you don't have good risk management. You could lose on both, like right? You can just you like can. just like anything else. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. But the the beauty of the options is if you're if you're in with one R, you're never going to lose more than one R, right? So yeah, of course you can lose on both sides, right? But the maximum risk is two R. Mm-hmm. There's no, it's like, you don't just get in and like the option keeps going to negative $200, right? It doesn't, it goes to zero. If you're wrong, right. it goes to zero, right? So yeah. if you're, yeah. So even if you are, if you're in one R on the long side, one R on the short side, so to speak, your max loss is two R. So you use these with, you also mentioned you like to use options to help you mitigate your risk with your, your long-term plays. I right? do. Yeah. And, and just to give people an idea, because there might be other people who listen to the show who, who like options and who trade options. What, what is an idea of what you do to kind of give them a perspective? Um, well, there's a bunch of things, but like when the market starts getting, you know, up, up around, well, for instance, all time highs, we broke that 3028. Um, um, I've created a model where it tracks the SPX, like even when you're in up in green or blue skies. It gives me good risk levels and calculations. So that whole time, I see these algos trading the market. I'm following it up. At every $100 area, I can buy puts. I can buy in the money puts. So let's say we hit, you know, we hit 300 on NVIDIA. I can buy 300 puts. If the price goes to 130 before my expiration, I have a right to sell uh, my stock at, two, at 300 bucks. So I can sit here and watch the price go to nothing. As long as I do it before expiration, I can sell my video to that person for 300 bucks. So I can use puts to lock in my gains. Hmm. That's one of the things. It's like an insurance policy, you know? You can yeah. Buy, right? You can no, sell I, calls. Yeah, I got you. I, you know, it's, it's, um, it's crazy. My buddy trades options all the time. He, he's like always trying to get me to understand it. And I'm, I like to stay in my lane. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I like to stay in my lane because it takes it. You know, it takes a while to to find you know what you're good at. So let's since I since I'm very ignorant when it comes to this. Why don't we talk more of what you know? What are some challenges you face now as a trader with your tenure? Right? Like, what are you you know what are you facing as a challenge? You know, because no matter where you're at in your skill level, whether you're making millions, a ten thousand a month, a year, it's we all face challenges. And so I'm curious on what challenge you may be facing. Uh, when it comes to trading and maybe any, any advice you can give on, on what you're trying to do to overcome that yourself. Sure, man. So it, it's a process, man. For me, everything is pro- like my ego. Ego is the big, to me, it's like the biggest trader killer, even with people I work with, right? It's so tough, man. But for me, it's still the same way. Like I have to really, I have triggers. I have to be really careful. You know, like I have triggers when I, when I say, um, if I ever say like, you know, I'm going to risk 20% here or if, I, if anything outside of my risk profile. So I, I call it a risk profile, but it's like, I define everything that I'm doing. It's like a business plan. You know, I don't get outside of that business plan. Right. But I do, <laughs> you know, the goal is to never get outside of that business plan. But, uh, you know, so that's my ego is always, it's a constant battle always. Um, you know, but I have these triggers. It, it helps me a lot. So if, if I, uh, if I say things where I'm going to take something else, like I love this trade, I'm fixing to pile in, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, if I'm going to, if I have these little triggers that kind of make me step back. Um, I joke all the time about step away from the mouse. You know, that's, I say that all the time, step away from the mouse. So when I got that itchy, clicky finger going on, man, I get up, I step away from the mouse, even if it's for two minutes, you know, just to come back, you know, clear your head before you click that button. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's ego. I, I can get, uh, you know, I try to be as unbiased as possible. So, uh, but that's it. Like I can get, I can still get stuck in a bias. That's mine. Still, it's always been my number one weakness. It still is. I just, I just work through it in a different way. I, I work through it. I'm better at managing it now than I was, but it still hasn't gone away. I don't know if they ever will. When you say triggers, it's interesting. So I'm assuming this and let me know, is, are these triggers that you now know because in the past, maybe you've done this. I mean, you've been trading for a while, so you probably said those things, whatever, whether it's, Oh yeah. Oh, this is this, this one's going to be a great trade. Like maybe you say that. And back in the day you used to say that, and then you took big losses because you were so strong bias on it. Is that what kind of those triggers came exactly. to you? Like, is that how they came to be? Exactly. Yeah, man. Exactly. 
So yeah, for me to take anything outside of my risk, you know, is, is a bad trade and I'll still do it. Sometimes I'll find myself in four R when I was thinking about a one R trade, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? I still, those, that's what I mean. I tried to develop those triggers around it so that I don't find myself in four R, you know, when I was only planning on one. So, but yeah. yeah, it's, it's all based on mistakes, man. I mean, I, the hardest lessons are always the, the hardest lessons to take, right? Those are always the best, man, by far. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so you, one of the things that you do is you like to say, step away from the mouse, right? So is that, what else do you do to help yourself when you, cause you know, maybe you find yourself getting, tr- you know, you, you hear yourself tr- using your trigger words for lack of a better term over and over. Is there anything you do? Do you have any safeguards in place just in case? Yeah. Trade options. <laughs> yeah that's the safeguards I, I don't I, I don't have any like no 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 max risks or anything like that you know on my on my account no yeah I, just, I literally I just trade options so but, but for me I mean I'm not I if, if I'm in you know three or four like I can do that it still happens every once in a while but you know I don't I haven't had a a 10% loss you know like a, relative to my account size in two years, two and a half years, probably since I've had anything that big When for me, it's like, if, if I'm in, when you're trading 1% of your account, if you're trading 1% of your account all the time or less, it's a completely different story. I mean, even when I'm in, you know, deep or doing something stupid or get t- on tilt or whatever you want to call it, you know, I, I mean, I, even then I'm not even getting outside of 1% of my account. So to me, that's, that's, it's just more, it's just a lot more relaxing. If I were to start like, and I have in the past, you know, I start kind of eating away at that account, eating away at that account. And then I can't trade my normal size at 1%, you know, then I have to back my size down. You know, I just, I have to back my size down. Now, if I get on till like I I dissect my trades on a daily basis, the executions, uh, not the P and L, but the executions. If, if I went outside of my risk is all that matters to me now Did I trade my system to go outside my risk. I don't care, you know, about the money. It's not that. Not that I don't care, but I mean, that's not what I'm looking at. I'm, I look at my P&L on a weekly basis. I'm looking at data. I'm looking at executions. I'm looking at my risk. Did I go outside my risk? If I did, you know, then I'm sizing down. Like I'm sizing down throughout the day. If I take a hit on that first one, I'm in 0.5R. I'm not going to be in anything deeper than that. So to me now, it's like, and if, and if that doesn't work, I'm in 0.25R. If, I, if it takes to the, you know, if I can't nail a freaking trade, you know, and I'm down to one contract and I can't nail that one, I'm done. <laughs> you know, so I use my sizing down to take me out. You know, I do, I do that. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I actually just started doing that myself, but like just naturally, I guess just slowly, like if I like, if I take a loss, I'll, you know, size down a little bit on my next trade until I get that confidence back and then I'll size back up. So right, that's, that's right. interesting. Are, are you, um, how, how do you go about, I'm just curious, because it, it sounds like when you said you, you mainly look at your executions and see if you were if you were successful in that trade, you know, based on your executions, did you trade it according to your plan? How do you yourself, I'm just curious in your thoughts on how you come up with a, a trade plan for yourself. Um, okay, so how I come up with a trade plan is, well, it's like I have all these, I, I mean, there's a lot of tools, so I, it's really, let me just, I'll just throw out some, some of my favorites, some of the bigger tools. Sure. I use Volume Profile. So I built this model that calculates levels where I think the big money's sitting. So that's my number one thing. I don't even use technical analysis anymore because I've come, grown to trust the model so much. I, I, I believe that the majority of the volume in this market is traded around a similar model. Not exactly, and I'll never nail it exactly, but the, the bulk of the volume is traded around a similar, similar model. You know, I've written enough algos now to where you know, I've, I've written my own. I write all my own stuff. I'm a programmer, so I've written all my own algos. And I understand it enough now to where when I see these things trade around this model, you know, it builds confidence. So that's number one. I, I trade around the model. Now I like gaps. I like gap magnet. I call it a gap magnet. It's like the beginning of the Mac, uh, beginning of the gap, those big breakup, breakdown candles, you know, like I, yep. I still look at those definitely on the dailies. Um, but everything else is trade around the model and then volume profile. I want to see volume come in, you know, at these levels. If I don't, then it's not trading around my model and I don't even want to touch it. Right. I just, I don't even care. Is it trading around my model? That's the question. And you know, about most of the time, about 90% of the stuff I trade trades around this model, but you know, there'll be sometimes, you know, 
Tesla will get like Tesla got down that momentum kick. You know, it's like I missed that first entry. So I just didn't touch it. I didn't mm-hmm. touch it until it exploded and came back and pulled into one of my main calculated levels. And then I caught a nice $200 long and you know, and that was it. I was done. Mm-hmm. Um, just things like that. Like I've, I've learned to trust it. So I look for that volume profile around those levels and then options are huge. I mean, and I'm talking like calculations daily, uh, you know, OIM calculations daily and, uh, the option flow. And I've got programming done in trade station where, you know, I'm looking for volume over open interest on certain strikes at the money strikes. And then, so like SPX, you know, spy is traded by, Buy options is traded by a lot of people. SPX options are generally traded by institutions getting in positions, right? And they buy options or they sell options against their positions like I do. And when you understand how they use these tools, they leave footprints, big ass footprints, (laughs) you know? They try really hard to hide them. They use dark pools. You don't see the prints till the end of the day on the consolidated tape, right? They try really hard, but most of them are picking up options against their positions and that they just can't hide it, man. And I'm just trying to get, when I know what they're doing and I can see what they're doing, that's what I'm looking to trade. Around. So that's the kind of trade plan I'm in it for, you know, I'm trying to find that good. I see an institution I believe is scaling into a position and, you know, and I watch how that thing is trading from the very beginning. How is it trading around my model? How is it trading? How's the options looking? How is the volume profile looking? And every, you know, every hour or so, I'm getting confirmation that my thesis is correct. I'm going to keep getting, I'm going to keep taking a little profits and building into that position. So that's how I like to trade. Initially, I'm trading one R. I start to see that confirmation go happening that my thesis is correct. And there is an institution, someone is piling in this. And I think it could continue for days. I'm going to keep rolling into that, take profits, take some of those profits, roll into another strike, roll into another strike, roll into another strike. And I'll do that for a week or two weeks or whatever and just keep walking that baby up until the trend changes or walking it down, you know. So there's a couple of things you mentioned that, that, that intrigued me. And that's, I'm going to mention the three and then we'll, one is uh, the footprint, right? The, they leave big footprints. And then number two is you seem to be really, and this kind of goes hand in hand, you seem to be really focused on, and you mentioned this earlier too, is you like to play where the big money is playing. Right. And and so, and then you, and then also number three, which is very interesting to me is you're, you're a programmer and you develop your own algo and, and that's like way out of my league in terms of like, I'm not computer savvy like that. So I'm just curious about all three of those and we'll start with the algo. I'm just curious on what was the thought process to you? I mean, because as a programmer, I don't, you're going to think completely different from a lot of other people, who, right? And so I'm curious on what your thought process was before you even thought of creating this algo and then when you decided to create it. Now, you don't have to give the full details of what your specific algo is. That's up to you. But like, just kind of the, the, the mindset behind that. So, all right. Yeah, sure. So do you, you, ever, you ever look at a chart, say, like 60 minute time frame? Okay, I don't trade one minutes, three minutes. I don't trade none of that nonsense. Okay. I'm looking at 15 minute, 30 minutes, 60 minute. Um, I, I will use a five minute to look inside of 15. I'll use a 15 to look inside of 30 minute. I'll use a couple of thirties to see what that 60 looks like. You know, that's how I like to trade every week. I want to see what the big money and what those weekly trades are. Right? So when you look at those candles, have you ever looked at a weekly candle and you see it open at the bottom and close at the very top? You know what I mean? That's big, fat, green body candles, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. Big, fat, red body candles, right? So what started that for me was, wow, if you start looking at charts, look at how consistently these things are created. They are so, they're created so consistently. I don't believe that it's possible that humans are that precise, right? They're just not that precise. And now yeah. if you go back and take a look at a penny stock and it's a wiki mofo and there's little bitty body candles. And the only time there's a candle bigger than a popcorn fart is when it's ripping faces off, right? <laughs> That's it. Okay. But, but when you start trading with big money and when people are getting in, you know, millions of shares to build their position, you know, a couple of, you know, a couple hundred million dollars in a trade, you can start to see those, those algos and work, man. They're working those candles. They're using time and price. You know, you can watch them buy. I mean, it's just, and so I started, you know, working on, you know, I built a thesis around it 
built a model around it, and then I started programming around it. Now, the, the algos that I'm programming, like all my, all my uh, model outputs and things like that, are, I'm still trading my own. My algos are not trading my money. Okay. I'm still working on building the algos. But what it is, the model is automated so that I don't have to draw lines on my chart. I don't have to do any of that stuff. It's all done automated. It's automatic, uh, drawn for me automatically. But it's all based on that. It's like, even if you look at a five-minute candle, you ever, you know, you think like, look at the opens and closes of these candles and they're, they're matching to the penny. You know what I mean? Like just tons and tons of candles that are just, yeah. you know, and it's like, so for me, the thought process was that, that just can't be, there's no way humans are that precise, right? They're just not that precise. That's a so good that, point. That's what really got me going, you know? Yeah, man. That, I like that. I, I mean, cause I've seen that too. I mean, we, we've all, if you've been trading long enough, you've seen, you've seen, such beautiful charts that it just doesn't make sense. Right. And, and, and that makes sense. I mean, the fact that you saw that on the bigger time frame, and then that, that told you, you know what, we're not, I mean, we're, we're humans, we're emotional. So our decisions are everywhere. So therefore the, for it to always be that way, it kind of intrigued you, which is cool. So when it comes to the, the footprint, was that the footprint? Is that what you mean? Like, that one example, like the, 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 the big candle opening low, closing high with obviously maybe some big volume or something like that. Or, or was it like a, something else that is more of a footprint for you? Well, so, so it's a combination of things, right? I mean, that's what triggered the thought process for me is look at this candle. I, I mean, if I could like one of the, the biggest trade in my career, for instance, if you look at um, it was in August and we dropped off of highs in uh in July and we ripped from June all the way up. We broke new highs, right? We dropped off of highs in July and then August, we just, we sliced and diced and chopped and you know, we hit this 20, it was 294. Okay. We kept hitting 294, pull back to 290, hit 294, pull back to 290, right? We just kept doing this all week. Then we trade back down to, you know, 2855. We'd come back up and I'm used to trading the SPX. So you'll hear me reference 2855. You can just take that as a 285 on the spot. Okay. okay? Gotcha. Cool. Okay, but so all, while all this is going on, if, if you look at a daily chart, you look at that daily chart of SPX in August, you're like, okay, that looks like some resistance, right? There's like three daily candles. You're like, okay, that's some resistance. Take it and put it on the 60-minute chart. You'll see like 160-minute candles, okay? It's not just three daily. There's like not 100, I'm exaggerating, but there's a lot, right? You start to see this, this story unfold. Now, if you take volume profile and you put it in on that and you see volume profile around these key levels, volume at price, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, yep. you know, holy shit, look at all this volume. Um, <clears throat> it starts to tell a story, right? So uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And you see those big candles and all that, all that stuff forming. It's like, um, I just want to get in the mind of these guys. So like literally, uh, I want to say, you know, tw somewhere in 2017, 18, I quit listening to all the podcasts that had anything to do with small caps. And all I did is I spent all my time trying to get in the brain and the mind of the institutions. That's it. That's, that's all I've done. And that's where I really started focusing on this and building that model around it. So, you know, it, it's not just that one thing, right? It's, it's a combination of these things. Right. And it's like, okay, I, I, it just starts to tell a story. You know, you can start to see where, you know, a, a truckload of, of volume comes in, I would say a number of institutions, including quant funds, right? And, and the way that these institutions have to manage risk is important to me because they statistically, right? They, they have a model that they have to trade around. They have to be able to explain to their clients how they manage risk. If you understand how the institutions manage risk, you can trade around it, right? And they don't, they're just like bots. Bots don't have a choice. They don't stop and think about it. Right? They don't get to a level and think about it. If they get a trigger, they buy. If they get a trigger, they sell, right? And I see institutional traders, you know, exactly the same way. Now, they do have, you know, human emotion and so forth, right? But right. they are constrained, right? They are constrained by their fiduciary duty to manage risk for their clients, right? And so they're just like algos. You know, they have to take certain trades at certain places. And when you really understand how that works, you'll start to see, you know, the theory, the thesis, you start to see it unfold. Can you explain what you mean by they have certain, and this could be, and, and I don't know, this could be specific, to, like this could be different for each 
stock or each ticket yeah, or whatever it may be. But like, it, what do you mean by they have certain risk parameters that they that they always have to uh, well typically have to abide by? Like, okay, how so how did you discern? How did you learn that? And how do you like? How do you how are you aware of that? So okay, so first of all, just I'll just give you the one an example. Let's say sure. Tesla is trading, getting up close to a thousand. There is going to be a point that now there was, you know, you know, there was so much money, right? There's a lot of money driving that thing, right? Lots and lots of money. Okay. Thousand dollar stock trading, you know, all of the, you know, all that volume, right? It, it's not a penny stock. There's no chump change, you know, that was traded from 300 to a thousand, right? So it's not me and you, you know, the little guys that were driving that price. It, it was, you know, it was institutions, right? Yeah. So at what point does it become, if you're trading for an institution, at what point are you going to get your hand slapped? You can't buy up there, right? You can't buy up there. So that's what I set out to define. You know, that's what I wanted to define. And if you do, if you, if you dissect the program and if you dissect every single channel within a, a program, within an algo, within a strategy, you start to see, and you see that volume profile, everything that I am thinking is being confirmed by all this stuff, right? So I start to paint a picture in my mind of what they're doing. That's how I come up with the, the, the plan and the thesis. And, and at first it's like, you know, Hey man, you might be onto something, you know, maybe that's repeatable. And so you, like, you keep working on it. Well, after two and a half years of doing this, I see it every single day over and over and over and over. Right. I can tell you exactly when these guys, they can't buy anymore, you know, and I'm not going to say exactly what that is, but it's because it's, it's because it becomes statistically. Okay. Yep. It becomes, um, you know, an 80% chance that it's going to pull back here, a 92% chance that it's going to pull back here, right? That's yep. what I'm talking about. It's a statistical edge. It's like, if they're going to be buying up there, you know, someone's going to be, you know, their risk manager is going to be on their ass, man. It's like, you can't buy up here. You know, this is where we're selling, right? This is where we're taking profits. And so once you kind of understand how these, to me, understand how these models work, then I just want to prove it. Like it's, it's just a thesis at this point. So yeah. I want to prove it. Right. And that's, that's what I've done. I just keep trading around it and trading around it and watching it and watching it and watching. I didn't really take, you know, trades around it at first so much as, as I do now. I mean, that's all I trade around now, but in the beginning I was just watching it, and, you know, dissecting it. And so, forth. you know, it's interesting that, you know, one of the things that you said really stands out and I think it, it's like a, it's a common theme among a t pretty much every trader. And, but it's interesting, you, you're trading something completely different, obviously, something that I've never traded, something I don't even care to trade. That's just not my style. But what's interesting is you found success in it. And what you said specifically is it something that you noticed that was repeating over and over. And then you're like, then you started creating an idea behind that and then a thesis. And then you created an algo. And now you have something that, that works very well for you. And I think a lot of traders out there need to hear that because, you know, over time, like, you know, you've been looking at this for years now. So you, it's like you can instantly tell as soon as you see it. Whereas, you know, as young traders, you come in the game and you're like, I can't see anything. Right. <laughs> and, it's all and noise it, to me, man. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and what's interesting is over time, I think the lesson is you will see it. You just got to keep looking for you just gonna you just need screen time. That's really what you're showing. If you have screen time and you pay attention and you analyze, like you analyze the hell out of that, analyze the hell out of it over and over, big picture, small picture, even smaller, and then you started to listen. You started to eliminate all the noise in terms of all of the other types of podcasts that were small caps, and you wanted to only focus on what are the big money doing because that's what you wanted to focus on, which helped you be successful. So I appreciate you sharing all that because. It's something that that that's just re, needs to be reinforced for me to hear, but also I'm sure for other people out there. And before we wrap this up, though, I, I do want to ask you two things. Number one, um, or number one would be, you know, what would be your biggest advice for anyone out there who maybe has been trading for a year and hasn't had their success yet? Any, any, any advice would you give someone like that? Yeah, man, respect your risk. <clears throat> respect your risk. I mean, and I'll elaborate just a little bit if you don't, if we got sure. time. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's a mathematical certainty. Okay. If, if you're going to be consistent with your size to your account, 
1%, 2%, whatever that is. Be consistent with that size. Let the size of your account, let your success, you know, increase your risk, right? Um, and manage your risk, respect your risk, period, because it's a mathematical fact. You're going to blow up an account. If you don't know how to manage your bankroll and you want to gamble for a living, you don't know how to manage your bankroll, I don't care how good you are, how lucky you are, if you can't manage your bankroll, you're guaranteed to blow up. It's a mathematical fact, okay? So if you're, if you're you know, 100 trades, you've got a 70% win rate. You're, here you are, you're cranking them out, you're cranking them out. You can't ever forget that 30 out of 100 are going to be wrong, right? Now, you could have had 70 in a row where you just respected your risk, respected your risk, respected your risk, and here comes number, you could even have 80. Here comes number 81. You're like, you know what? I'm sizing up, man. This is it. This is my home run, baby. Boom. And that's the one that's wrong. And then there goes your account, right? Respect your risk. Manage your risk. Size up accordingly. Make yourself earn a risk increase. And do that by the size of your account. And, you know, that and, you know, wire out the money. You know, 50% of your gains every week. If you're making money, wire it out. Do something. Psychologically, do something for yourself. Pay off debt buy something, you know, those are a couple of things that, that I see. And I work with a lot of younger traders sometimes too. If you can, nobody ever listens, no one ever does it, you know, very rarely, but I say it over and over again, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's huge advice. And, and, and that, and that equates, I mean, that also reinforces the screen time because if you can survive and then you get that screen time and then you can eventually get it. It so does. I appreciate Yeah. And sizing I, down, right? Like we were talking about earlier. Yes. Don't forget about that. Like that's a really important thing. Give yourself a chance to get, if you're on tilt or, you know, whatever, or you just, you know, or you just, you were wrong the first trade, but give yourself a chance to get your groove back, you know, size down, take a little bit smaller trades as you get your groove back, right? You can add to a winner. Yep. Right? Whatever you do, don't size up when you're wrong. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's so true, man. Like you, you could be, I, I fell in that cycle where, you know, when I first started trading, before I started seeing consistency and profitability, I was, dude, I constantly would have like six months doing good or three months in a row. And then just one, or, one trade would start it and then I would tilt and then just go right down. So right. you got to you gotta have, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to have risk control. You got to have, that's why I implemented all of these rules because I've made a ton of mistakes. So look, I, I appreciate your, you sharing all this, man. I really do, Scott. And if anything, if anyone wants to reach out to you, what, what's like the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, smash it. Smash the bid on Twitter. Um, or just, it's at smash the bid on Twitter. It's a good one. I answer all the DMs there. They're always open. Um, my website, smash the bid.com. Either one. And it's smash it. Smash the bid is my email. But you can just reach me on Twitter. I answer all the DMs. It might take me a day. I only get on Twitter about once a day, but, or once every couple of days, whatever. But I always answer the DMs for sure. So that's really the best way. Cool, man. Cool. Well, I, well, like I said at the beginning, man, I appreciate I appreciate you being here on the show with me. I appreciate you sharing some of your knowledge and being patient with me as I don't know options as much, but I really appreciate your time and thanks for being here, man. Yeah, man. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate you having me.